On the next episode of Painting and Travel, Roger and Sarah Batsimer head for the Great Lakes. Join in as Sarah visits the historic Michigan Maritime Museum, while Roger sets up his easel and paints a scene along the shoreline. This is Lake Michigan, and we've been visiting the beautiful town of South Haven for the last couple of days. The weather is broken now, and it's a beautiful day. I think it's going to keep this way for a couple of days, so I'm going to take this opportunity to paint the uh, beach here. So my materials for today are acrylics, titanium white, ultramarine blue, Indian yellow, cadmium yellow, naphthol red. Then I have three earth colors here. I've got yellow ochre, burnt sienna, and burnt umber. For my brushes today, I have a couple of flat brushes called brights. I have a fan brush, and I may use a, one small pointed brush. And of course, I have my little spray bottle. This helps to keep my paints, my acrylics wet. I'll be painting on a masonite board today. This is an 11 by 14 inch masonite board, but I wanted it a little bit smaller, so I taped it off into a nine by 12 inch board. One thing I've really had to be conscious of when I'm doing these painting videos is to keep my subjects very simple. Uh, I was outside painting yesterday down at the uh, Michigan Maritime Museum. I spent about three, three and a half hours painting down there, and by the time I got through, the light had changed so much that it was a totally different subject, almost unrecognizable from the subject I first started to paint. So I stopped and uh, took a photograph of it so I can continue my painting back at home. This is a quite a simple scene here. It's got some simple basic elements to it, and I think I can complete this fairly quickly. Kind of like the composition here, I can divide it into thirds, which is always a safe bet when it comes to compositions. I've got my large, or my little bush over here. My horizon line is about a third of the way down. So I've divided it into thirds. In a composition like that, it's pretty hard to go wrong. I'm just picking up a little bit of ultramarine blue and burnt umber, just so I can sketch this in here. I love this beautiful fence down here. We're so lucky today to get good weather. It's fall right now, the leaves are changing. It's quite beautiful. And I think we're hitting it on the last few days of good weather. Another reason I like this subject is because we had such a beautiful and subtle variety of greens here. We've got these sort of very warm greens in the front and very cool greens in the background. This bush here is a very warm green. This down here is a variation of different greens but it's uh, hopefully what's going to make the painting interesting. And we got some sand, little sand dunes coming in here. So that's basically my layout. I don't need too much more drawing than that on a piece like this. Right now, Sarah is at the Michigan Maritime Museum looking at a very unusual boat. The locals around here call them tugs, but actually they're called gill net fish boats. And a uh, few of them are still in use. They were used for fishing the Great Lakes for years and years. They had a very unusual engine in them called a Kallenberg engine, and they fished primarily for uh, chubs and uh, whitefish. Yeah. Well, this might be a good time for me to get a bit more organized here and finish laying this out. You can uh, catch up with Sarah as she takes a tour of one of these boats.
This is Jim Schneider, who is taking a few minutes out of his busy day to show us one of these historic boats used on the Great Lakes, named the Evelyn S. Jim says this is an example of a Great Lakes gill netter, and this one we'll be able to look inside of, so that'll be fun. The Evelyn S is a, a great example of a unique Great Lakes uh, type of vessel used in the gill net fisheries fully covered so they could operate year round. They would break ice with these vessels running right through January through March. Break ice? Yeah. How do they do that? They go in really fast and uh, smash into it. Well, it's like a up. bull in a china shop. Then you yeah. just crash and Occasionally they get stuck. And we've got some great uh, historic photographs of piles of these boats stuck out there in the ice and the guys walk into town to get some more coal for their wood stove to keep them warm. Oh my gosh. So nobody can unstick this one if it gets stuck in the ice? Well, the, the, the other boats, all the fishermen band together and try to help the other guys out. Depends on the wind. If the ice blows the pack to this side of the lake, you're out there for a while. It's hard to imagine how cold that would be. Yeah, it's quite. But with the size of the old engines they had in here, it kept them toasty. South Haven is uh, somewhat unique in the Great Lakes ports in that we actually have three Kallenberg diesel boats right here in the lake. Two of them are in the, in the harbor operating right now. One of them is uh, very similar to this in that it's an uh, original Great Lakes gill netter with the Kallenberg with an identical engine. And she's right over there by the museum's top. And you can take that one out for rides? Yeah. The Jensen family, who's owned it since it was a fishing vessel, uh, takes people out and uh, they go dive on shipwrecks and takes them out for evening tours and such. Oh. I noticed a little dog on it with a life preserver. I guess that's a good idea. Yeah, it's a family operation there. Huh, that's nice. Well, let's walk around this one and see what else we can find. We're entering the Evelyn S here at the stern. This is where the gill nets were launched from. Well, as you see, it's fully enclosed. That's, again, because they operated year-round, and the Great Lakes can be very uh, cold and mm -hmm. actually quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. And here you've got the Kallenberg diesel. It, uh, this one's a little, a little uh, well, let's just say it's original, unrestored. Uh, we have two others operating here by the museum that are in uh, immaculate condition. This one's still awaiting restoration. These engines are quite fun to operate in that you actually light a match and light a torch on top of each one of these cylinders to heat them up. And uh, they're direct reversing too, so if you want to go into reverse, it's not like a transmission. You have to stop the engine, reverse the timing, and fire it up in the reverse. And you can only shift about 10 times until you run out of compressed air and then you got to wait a while. Gosh, <laughs> okay, so this is not for quick no. maneuvering. This is the kind of engine where you have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Everything on this boat is where it was when we got the boat uh, donated about uh, 25 years ago from uh, Raleigh Sylvester. All the parts that are still sitting there on the shelves, the tools in the boxes below, the granite chunks that are ballast for this vessel. Where are the granite chunks? Oh, right down here in the bilge. Big block. Oh, that's the ballast down yeah. there. To help keep her from rolling over. These boats, uh, when they operated in the, the weather, they operated and they just about go underwater plowing through the waves. Very seaworthy. As you move forward, uh, you'll see the pilot house. This is where the captain would steer the vessel from. Notice the tiny portals that you had to look through. Uh, that's because uh, the waves crashing over the vessel would smash out any larger windows. Oh. So you have these smaller portals. And these would actually ice up in the winter and you couldn't see through them. So what they did with this boat, this one we're on, uh -huh. is they ran the engine coolant water out those handrail pipes you see. And that warm water would drip down the sides of the boat to melt the ice off so that she wouldn't roll over. Those were some hardy souls that worked on this vessel. As we walk forward uh, into the bow, you'll see where the nets were retrieved on the starboard side. Uh, that's a net lifter you see there. Much of the equipment on this vessel was actually steam equipment that was taken off of old steam fishing tugs uh, when this one was built and now run off compressed air. And so this, this equipment is much older than the vessel actually is. Uh, once the nets were grabbed off the starboard side there, they'd wrap the net around this net lifter, which is spinning around, and pull the nets down into this into a box like this. The nets would actually be flaked a lot nicer. And then they'd pick the fish. The crew would pick the fish and be packing them in ice. Uh, you notice how closely together the, the frames are uh, to make, give the vessel strength for breaking ice. It's a wooden vessel, but sheathed in steel on the outside to, again, help with the ice. Those fishing boats, Sarah was just looking at her, are quite unusual. I've painted some of them in the past and really enjoyed looking at them. They're very unusual, the shape of them. They always sort of reminded me of an old wooden shoe more than they did a boat. 
The basic colors I have here are primary colors, blue, yellow, and red. Now I have a, uh, two colors of yellow, Indian yellow and cadmium yellow. The Indian yellow is a warm yellow, the cadmium yellow is a cool yellow. And I just wanted to get those couple yellows up there so I could get more variety of greens. And I often like to use my uh, uh, earth tones for paintings like this because there's just a lot of earth tones back here in these grasses. I'm trying to lay enough color on this sky so I don't have to go back and give it a second coat. Often these acrylics just don't cover that well on the first go around. I'm going to pick up a little bit of yellow ochre because always down near the horizon here, the sky is a bit warmer than up here towards the zenith. So I'm going to warm that up just a little bit. I'm just going to continue to lay in some of these green colors down here and get the whole canvas covered. That way I can start making adjustments and comparing all my colors as I go. I don't really want to settle on one color, one value, and one tone right off the bat, although I think this will probably be left as it is, this sky. And I'll make the other adjustments down here in the grass. Ultramarine blue and burnt sienna make sort of an interesting green down here. Got some nice little sand dunes coming up here. I'm going to cover this all with green to begin with, and then I'll put those sand dunes coming in over that. There are definitely advantages to painting outside, many of which I really, really love. But there's always situations that arise when painting on location that are just difficult. If it's, the, if it's not the sun, it can be the wind, um, just all kind of conditions. And just like yesterday when I was painting, the sun changed and my basically my whole subject changed. So I like this combination of painting on location and painting in the studio. What I want to do is try and establish my lightest lights and my darkest darks and just get these values all to, to working together. Now I'll, uh, so I've got my lights, I've got my darks. Now I have these middle tone values in here. I wanted some nice smooth brushwork in the sky, but down here, I really like to leave this brushwork just pretty rough because it just uh, indicates all that texture in the grass a little bit better than had I painted it with some nice big flat strokes. I'm putting a little bit of white in this green back here because it's in the distance and as things move in the distance, the color starts to disappear. So the most vivid, intense colors are always going to be in the foreground. As we move back, those colors start to lose their intensity. Well, I have a pretty good sense of the color values now in my painting. I can see some of the colors are off right away. Of course, this, uh, this water is not quite the right color. I don't want to make it too blue. Even if it were really, really blue, I think I would tone it down. Getting too many really colors out of the tube just in a painting tend to read false. So I uh, always cut those colors down just a little bit. Now as things go back in space, they get softer. So we'll have harder edges up here and softer edges back there. And I'm going to make this edge along the water here very soft, even though I'm seeing it as a very hard line out there. And the reason I'm seeing it as a hard line is because that horizon is not that far away. Uh, if I'm standing on the shore, the horizon falls off the edge of the earth at about three and a half miles or so out. So that's not a great distance. Uh, yet there could be some mountains back there that could actually be much further away than that. So um, that could rise up above the horizon. So in painting a landscape, for instance, in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains or the Rocky Mountains, uh, the edges on those objects are, are definitely much softer than looking at the horizon, which really, like I said, isn't that far away. But I like to keep that edge soft even though visually I'm not seeing it that way because it gives me a sense of depth in the painting. But one thing that does help is to 
spray it with a little water. That helps me blend these colors. Even if the sky color is dry, by spraying this a little bit, it doesn't necessarily rejuvenate the color that's already dry, but it helps me blend this wet color into the dry color. Or maybe I should say not blend it, but it helps me to just slide the wet color over the dry color. While I have this yellow ochre out here, I think I'll take a little bit more of it. Keep this sprayed so it stays wet. Maybe add a little bit of my sand in here. Put some in there. We've got some nice shadows running up in here too, so the shadows are definitely cool. I'll add a little bit of blue, burnt sienna. Make a few shadows. It's very, it's very strange when I squint my eyes and look at those shadows and look at the water. They're not far different in color and value. They're somewhat different. Um, the, the shadows in the sand tend to be a little bit warmer uh, than the water here, but they're, they're definitely that bluish color. The colors down here in the foreground are pretty dark right now, but there's a good reason for that, and that's all the light colors of these leaves and everything, they're on top of the dark colors. So it's good for me to start with the dark colors and then add and build up with these lighter colors on the top of that. As I squint my eyes, which I always do, I'm always squinting my eyes because when I squint my eyes, it simplifies all the shapes, sort of makes everything a little more easy to see. In some ways, when you see less, you see more when you do a painting like this. It helps to bring everything, as far as relationships, into a better focus. It's very important for me to describe the edge of these weeds as much as I can, because the description of what goes on right here will really tell me what's going on down here. If I were to segregate just an area of this green right in here, you really couldn't tell what it is nearly as much as you can tell from where the edge of these weeds are. So it's important for me to get some nice descriptive passages here where these weeds grow up. Well, before things change much, light conditions and so on, uh, I think I'll take a photograph here with my digital camera. I can't tell you how many times this has saved me in the past from being able to complete a painting or not. So it's always a good idea to have a digital camera along for reference. Well, that gives me some trees back there, and I'll just continue on with this. Maybe some Indian yellow, ultramarine blue. And I'm going to add a little more white to that because we have some larger trees back here. The reason I want to add a little bit of white to that is because I want all my intense colors up here. I don't want too many intense colors in the background because that will tend to bring all that forward. And I want to uh, try and keep that looking like it's in the background. Just using the brush here on its edge to create a nice soft edge on these trees. Pretty ordinary painting so far, but really my center of interest hasn't been placed in there yet. I did originally just to lay things out, but this tree and this fence will become my center of interest. I'm trying to get everything else done before I place those in there because it'd be pretty hard to paint my sky or the background around this tree. So that's probably one of the last things I'll put in here. Acrylic paints handle much differently outside than they do inside. Can't tell you exactly what it is, but uh, I think painting outside with acrylics, I'm much more limited as to my possibilities. And I think that's primarily just because of the drying factor. There's a nice little white house back there. I'm tempted to put that in, but I'm not sure. So I'm just gonna take a piece of charcoal. If I had a piece of chalk, it would work even a little better. I'll just draw that in there and see if it might work. And I think it will. So with just a couple of strokes here, ultramarine blue, burnt umber to make sort of a grayish color. Just a couple little strokes here. Kind of looks like an arrow though, doesn't it? Arrow pointing up. Well, we'll fix that. Maybe just another little part of the building. Just going to grab a little pointed brush right now. And before I paint that tree in here, I'll just put a few little windows in that house. Yeah, it's a little human interest. 
As I look at this, I think I want to tie this area in with this area a little bit more. So I'm going to bring these fence posts up a little bit higher. Maybe even cover this house a little bit. Yeah, that's, uh, that helps to tie these two big areas together. Down here I'll put some highlights, but in just this one color I'll knock them all in there to begin with. These fences help to hold the sand on the beach. And this fence kind of just disappears down here in these weeds. Now I want this to be very soft. So I'm going to spray my board up here with some water. I really sort of have only have one chance with this. I'm using a fan brush. An old beat up brush also works good with leaves like this. Yeah, let me try an older brush. This is, this is a big flat, but it's pretty well had it. It's kind of rough, rough shape. So let me give this a try for these leaves. I want that to dry out either, so I need to keep spraying that. And spraying that gives me the soft edge that I'm looking for. When I spray that water on there, the water just helps disperse that paint a little bit as I put it on the board. I think it's nice that in this composition that this tree run out of the frame. So many times in paintings, the uh, subject matter seems a bit, a bit too small. So I want to be able to fill my canvas with everything I can. I never, never bothers me to destroy something I've already painted. Of course, in this case, it's going to be this house back here. I'm going to lose part of that house. As I do this tree, I keep moving my brush around. I don't keep doing it in one particular pattern. I move it this way, this way, back and forth. That way it'll give me a variety of texture. Now with my small pointed brush, I'll put in some of these branches. I guess it's always a question of what do you put in the branches first or the leaves? But it, it, it varies. It just uh, could be either way, really. I don't want to go overboard with these branches. I just want enough in there to describe this bush. And we've got some bigger branches down here. They're not going to show up very well, the color I'm using, so I'll uh, lighten this a bit. When I paint branches, I do what called sort of a lost and found kind of thing. First you see the branch, then you don't see it. So I don't want to paint one branch all the way up because that would just put it in the foreground. But as it is, there's leaves and all kind of other things over these branches. So I see them, then they kind of disappear it's back and forth. I'm pushing some of the values on this just to suit myself. I don't see this fence post as being as light as it is. But I need to, at some point, abandon what I see in real life and start concentrating more on this painting and what it looks like as a painting. Down here, if I make this fence posts light, they're not going to show up because this is a light green. So it's always light against dark, dark against light. It seems to work. And these are all attached by a little wire. So I'll just indicate how they're tied together. I find it more interesting to use a fan brush and actually larger brushwork in making detail than trying to paint every little stroke, every little weed and reed here. I'd rather use a larger brush and try and suggest as much of this as I can rather than try and paint every single little detail. I have such a variety of color and texture down here. Much more than in the background. In the background everything seems to homogenize and become sort of one color. But up here in the foreground everything becomes much richer. There are some large leafed vines growing amongst these weeds. And they make a nice variation in the foreground. We also have some little weeds back here that are very warm in color. I don't know what they are. But they're quite attractive. And uh, since they're there, they also help me to make this composition a little more interesting. Here's a fun part, some negative areas. We'll put a few negative areas in here. So I'll mix up some of this color that's in this background. I can put some of these negative areas between the post. That means I'm seeing some of the light and the weeds come between these posts. These negative areas will bring that back into focus. It's probably one of the more fun things to work on in a painting is 
playing with negative areas. One of the most difficult parts of a painting is knowing when to quit. And I've ruined more paintings by continuing on when I should have stopped. To this day, I never really know when to quit. My rule of thumb is when I don't know what else to do, it's probably time to quit. A painting can be made with just a couple of good strokes and it can be destroyed with a couple of bad strokes. The uh, light's changing and I think uh, I'm going to call it quits. I have all I need on this painting to bring it back to the studio and put some finishing touches on it. So we've really enjoyed ourselves here at South Haven, Michigan, right on this beautiful lake, Lake Michigan. So I think I'll uh, bring this back to the studio I'll work on it a little bit more, put in some more detail. We'll take a look at it then after I sign it, varnish it, and then uh, we'll see what it looks like. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.